I came to Wacky in June of 1976 and left in August of 1985. What's, what's the magic of Wacky? Everybody talks about it. You know, I, I can't address that from the perspective of a listener, but only as somebody who worked there. It, it had a reputation long before I got there, obviously, as uh, a place that attracted great talent. And I think that was largely because talent knew that they could practice their craft. Uh, you know, it was a place where Gary Burbanks and Bill Bailey's and, and people uh, of that nature, Coyote Calhoun, could could be individual personalities and, and weren't going to be uh, as restricted by format as some stations were. Now, it was still, the, the restrictions that a lot of people have these days hadn't entirely come into fashion then, but Top 40 Radio, the KHJ thing, was, was getting toward the eight-second intro, and, and that was not the case at Wacky. You were allowed to be a personality. And were you there when it ended? No, um, I left, um, uh, I took it oldies in 1982, and it was still oldies when I left in 1985, but it had been bought by Bob Fish, some people from up north, and you know, the writing was on the wall. It was an AM station in an FM world, and uh, so, uh, no, it, it went on for a couple of years after that, but, okay. You guys did a lot of promotions when you were back. What were some of the promotions you were uh, you know, we didn't have much of a budget to work with on that kind of stuff. Now, uh, the one exception to that were, were the years when Mike McVeigh and George Francis were there. And George Francis is absolutely a promotional genius, and he taught me all I know about marketing. And the uh, the Wacky Car Star and the Happiness Is direct mail uh, promotion uh, were all things that George came up with, even though other people took credit for them in later years. And, uh, and they were enormously successful for us. But in the days before those guys came in, and in the days later when, when it was an oldie station, we didn't have much of a budget. And in fact, the Wacky Goes to War promotion started when I was called into the manager's office, told we had $2,500 to do a book promotion. What did I plan on doing? Well, I hadn't thought of anything because I didn't know we had any money. So, but they wanted an answer right now. So, off the top of my head, I said, "I've got this great idea. Wacky Goes to War." And then I made up some explanation of what it meant, and we ended up doing the promotion. You may have seen the pictures of us uh, going over to WHAS with a uh, mounted machine gun and demanding their immediate surrender. <laughs> uh, but that, that was just all off the cuff because I was surprised that somebody had actually come up with some money. Now, tell us about when it went to an oldest format. Who made that decision and you can't say And then well, what, why did they go to <laughs> Uh, part of the deal when I came to Wacky was that I would work a five-day week. I wouldn't have to work Saturday and Sunday. And at some point along the way, they said, look, because of budget reasons, you're going to have to work six days. And the compromise that we reached was that I would do the show on Sunday night, but I could play whatever records I wanted to play. And that was really the genesis of a show called Fourth Street Sunday Night, which became enormously popular. It was the highest rated day part on the station. And uh, so that led to me taping that show and running it the following Saturday. So I was really on the air seven days a week. And then one day they came to me and they said, well, we want you to do a live show on Saturday as well as being recorded on Saturday and Sunday. And I said, guys, you know, six days a week is bad enough, but seven days a week I'm not going to, eight days a week I'm not going to do. So I quit without a job and I went home um, and sat there for a few weeks. And in the meantime, somebody at, at corporate had come up with the idea that the oldies format, doing what I was doing on Sunday night, would be a better option than what they were doing then. And so they called and said, how'd you like your job, how'd you like to come back to Wacky and be program director? And that's that's how all of that started. It was one of the first all oldie radio stations in America. There was WCBS FM in New York was on, there was one in Tulsa, there may be a hand, uh, been a handful of others, but very few. Uh, at that time in Louisville, you could have easily gone a year and never heard a Roy Orbison song or a, uh, uh, you very rarely have heard a Beatles song. What was the success? 
Oh, it was tremendously successful. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it drew a lot of attention to the station, and our first book was just tremendous, and the guys from corporate all came down and patted me on the back and took me out to dinner. But what happened as a result of that was WHAS started putting more emphasis on their overnight show with Joe Donovan, who was playing all these. RKA started the 50s at 5 and the 60s at 6, and other stations who had never touched this kind of music started. Leonard Yates, who was on Wacky, was hired away to go over to one of the other stations. And so, all of a sudden, you could hear this music on FM and stereo that we were playing on AM and mono, and at that point, there was really no future in it. So when you left Wacky, I left Wacky in 1985. Uh, George Francis, who had been uh, one of the GMs at Wacky, who I was talking about earlier, uh, started his own radio company and he bought a, a country station in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I'd always wanted to do country. He was a big fan of that. So uh, George hired me to go down and be program director of his station in Shreveport. And that station went from a 3.7 to a 17.8 in about 18 months. I'd like to take credit for that, but it was really George's marketing genius. That was my ticket to Baltimore. I was in Baltimore at WPOC, the country station there, for about 10 years. Went to work for Mike McVeigh, who had been, you know, I, I was his assistant PD at Wacky as a consultant uh, in 1997. And then in 2002, I went in-house with one of my clients, Regent Communications, and I'm now the vice president of programming for Regent. So, it worked out. Anything else, Bob, you'd like to say about Wacky? No, I, I, I just would reiterate what I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people have said, is it, it was so remarkable uh, to have a station in a city this size that had the kind of radio talent that it had. Uh, somebody was talking earlier about guys went on, 15 guys went on to work in top 10 markets or something like that, and that just doesn't happen out of cities like this. But the other thing that people don't talk as much about is the great musical heritage that this city had with bands like the Monarchs and the Epics and the Sultans and Cosmo and the Counts and all of those people, some of, some of those bands still being around, but there was a great musical heritage here as well. And the only other thing I would point out about this reunion that I haven't heard anybody else mention, these guys all paid their own expenses. You know, this is to benefit big brothers and big sisters, and that's wonderful. But to my knowledge, nobody had their expenses reimbursed, and some of these people have paid hundreds of dollars in airfare and rental cars and hotels just to be here and see each other again, and it's, it's a very special evening.